All right, let's get started, okay. Okay, so part two of our discussion. So now we are going to focus on post hoc explanation methods, right? So let's think about explanations a bit more because unlike what we have been talking about so far, uh, there is no longer a model that is trying to be inherently interpretable here or produce things that can be interpreted, right? So now we are in a situation where we essentially have this kind of a complex classifier. We can't touch the classifier, or that's the setting that we are working with. We don't want to change anything about this classifier. But there is an end user, and we need to sort of provide some interpretable description of this model's behavior to the end user, right? So the explanation will be an interface between this complex model and the end user. So it has to almost have two key properties. So the first thing is the explanation should faithfully describe the behavior of this classifier, right? So if the explanation is not correctly describing model behavior, then essentially it's not useful even if it is interpretable to the user, right? Um, that's one piece of it and the other side of it is whatever we are producing should be able to be, uh, should be interpretable to the end user, right? So those are the two pieces and then the sort of complexity in this entire scenario comes from what exactly do we mean by understandable to the end user and that depends quite a bit on the nature of the end user themselves, right? So whether they are machine learning experts, whether they are domain experts, all of those aspects, and you know that's something that we are going to also talk about a bit more later, right? So for example, when we think of, oh, we just need to provide an interpretable description of the model behavior, that could look like any of the following. For example, you could just send all the model parameters theta, and if this is somebody who is building a model themselves or you know is a scientist researcher engineer who understands machine learning they may be able to make some sense of it right so that's some form of like providing that person more information or you could basically send many example predictions and say that you know for this example this is the output i get for such examples this is the output i get and so on or you could summarize with a program or a rule or a tree all these kinds of constructs that we talked about earlier. Or you could sort of select most important features or points that are influencing the prediction. Or you could sort of describe how to flip a given model's prediction. So all of these are possible explanations of a complex model to an end user, right? Now, which one is more apt depends on exactly what your application is and also who your end user is. Right? So for example, I can't send all the model parameters theta to a doctor and assume that they would make any sense of it. Right? But whereas if I tell them things like most important features, they might be able to use that information. Right? Okay. So at a very high level, the literature on post hoc explanation methods can be divided into two classes of explanations. So one is local explanations and the other is global explanations. I think the names are pretty descriptive, but like let's just walk over what these means, right? So local explanations, the goal of these, these explanations or these methods is to explain individual predictions of the model, right? So if we have one prediction, how is that prediction coming about? Or what are the factors that are impacting that prediction? Now global explanations on the other hand, they try to describe to the most part complete behavior of the model. So they try to give a global picture of the model's behavior, okay? So their goals are also slightly different, again, you know, because of the way they're sort of like thought about. Uh, local explanations typically help us unearth any kinds of biases or models reliance on spurious features, etc., in a given local neighborhood of an instance. Whereas global explanations help shed light on big picture issues or big picture biases affecting larger subgroups in the population, right? And uh, again, uh, I guess it kind of follows from what we are discussing earlier. So why local explanations help vet if individual predictions are being made for the right reasons, uh, global explanations help vet if a model at a high level is suitable for deployment, right? So these might seem like somewhat trivial issues, but like in practice, these things are important 
because for example, before we even deploy a model, so there needs to be, let's say in a hospital or you know, uh, in a court system and so on, there needs to be like approvals or high level authorities need to approve that, okay, these models are you know, fine enough to be deployed, right? So for in that case, we can't give them you know, a bunch of local predictions of like 1 million points and say, now use this to vet your model. So for them, the global description is very important so that they can see a big picture view of what's going on, right? So in practice, these differences play a very significant role in enabling certain applications and practices versus the others, okay? All right, so this is broadly the different set of uh, post hoc explanation methods we are going to look at. Uh, so first, we are going to focus on local explanation methods. Under that, you know, the, the thing about, you know, sort of what we discussed so far and how it ties to this is, you might see some familiar constructs here that we already talked about in the context of inherently interpretable models, right? Uh, whether it is the rules, whether it is, you know, feature importances, whether it is prototypes, so these constructs will repeatedly occur through this entire literature, whether you're talking about inherently interpretable models or post hoc explanations. Okay, but these bring a whole new set of challenges with them because you know, we are considering approximations of another model here, right? Okay, so let's jump into the first and a very popular class of local explanations, which is feature importances, right? Uh, so I'm sure some of you have heard of this method called LIME or SHAP, you know, because these are pretty popular and if you're looking for, I want an explanation method, you might run into repositories and, you know, packages which have implementations for these, right? So this, this was, I think, one of the initial methods that came up within this area of post hoc explanation methods. And the algorithm or the actual method is actually very simple and intuitive, right? So what this is trying to do, again, remember that there's a local explanation, which means we are trying to explain individual predictions of model, just one prediction at a time, right? And the way this method works is, let's say our goal is to sort of explain the prediction of the model on that instance that you see on the screen. And the models, the underlying model's decision surface is this kind of complex nonlinear surface that you see, uh, you know, sort of uh, below the plus mark. And the way you sort of proceed with this algorithm is that you take that point, let's call it xi, and then you perturb that point several times and you basically generate instances around xi, right? So you add some random Gaussian noise to x and then you generate a bunch of instances in the local neighborhood of x or xi, okay? All right, so now use the underlying model to predict the labels for each of these perturbations that you generated, right? So now take the underlying model and determine the predictions of each of those points. And then uh, weigh these samples according to the distance to xi, right? So points that are closer to xi will get higher weightage and points that are farther away from xi will get lower weightage. And essentially you do that weighting and then you basically fit a simple linear model, like a linear regression or a logistic regression on these weighted samples, okay? So that's pretty much what this does. And now your simple linear model, it gives you a bunch of coefficients or weights associated with different features, and that becomes your explanation because that provides feature importances, okay? So the algorithm is super simple as you can see, so you literally take a point, <coughs> perturb it a bunch of times, generate a local neighborhood, and get the model's predictions on that local neighborhood, and then fit a linear model on those instances and their predictions, right? So that's it, okay? All right, so uh, this paper also kind of gives some interesting examples which have become like classic examples of thinking about explanations and their necessity, and we have already seen some of this in our motivation. For example, if we just look at the predictions made by, let's say, some models, we might see that, oh, there's only one mistake, so maybe the model is actually doing extremely well, right? So it's predicting everything correctly, there's only one image where it's making a mistake. But on the other hand, once you see the explanations output by this method, what you realize is what we have essentially built is a snow detector, right? So this kind of insight can only be obtained from uh, explanations. 
Okay. So uh, alongside Lyme, another popular method that often comes up when you think of or when you actually even search for post hoc explanation methods is called SHAP, right? So SHAP is also trying to play along the similar intuitions as that of Lyme, and it has a lot of connections with Lyme. Uh, but at a very high level, what SHAP is trying to do is estimate marginal contribution of each feature towards the prediction and you sort of average this contribution across all possible permutations. So what I mean by that is, let's take an example where we have uh, three features, so x1, x2, and x3, okay? And now we want to come up with this feature importance according to Shapley values for x1, right? So we want to determine what is the contribution of x1. So the way SHAP operates is actually very simple, but you know, scalability issues arise, which, which needs a lot more tricks to happen in the background for that to work out. But essentially the idea is you compute how much does the prediction change, prediction of the underlying model change with or without X1 for different permutations of the features, right? So first you see, okay, so with no features, what will be the prediction? If you add x1, what will be the prediction, okay? Then with x2 alone, what will be the prediction? If you add x1, what will be the prediction? What's the difference? And again, the marginal contribution of adding x1 to x3, right? So essentially for each such combination, you are computing what is the result of, for example, adding x1 to the mix minus what is the result of not having x1 in the mix. Right? So you do this for every possible future permutation, and then you sum up and average all those marginal contributions. So that's what will constitute the Shapley value or the contribution or importance of uh, each feature, and this is how you can compute it. But as you can see, you know, once you get into perm permutations a lot, you know, this will become a very hard problem to solve computationally, and there are tricks for approximating these and so on but you know, that we are not going to get into. But here is the high level intuition, okay? All right. Now in this class also, uh, there are some rule-based methods which are pretty popular. So one of them is anchors, which can be thought of as a rule-based variant of line we talked about, right? And anchors essentially relies on the same tactics as that of line. So what we do is if you want to uh, sort of think about the explanation of an instance X, you perturb that instance X to generate the local neighborhood, just like you did for line. And then what you do is you try to find a rule that sort of correctly covers that local neighborhood. Right? So again, if you recap and think back to this decision sets or rule sets that we were talking about, there also the goal was to find some rules which nicely and correctly cover a certain space or the data set in that case. Here we are just trying to find the rules uh, that correctly cover the local neighborhood. So the intuitions are the same. Uh, we're not going to go over the details of the algorithm. But roughly you're trying to find rules that cover the local neighborhood correctly. So for example, let's say here is a data point and this is the prediction of that data point. Uh, so Lyme's explanation will basically tell you the importance and the direction of the importance, positive or negative, for each feature. Whereas anchor explanation is basically that rule that is sort of covering the local neighborhood. Okay. Okay, so the next class of local explanation methods that's very popular, especially in images and computer vision, is saliency maps. Uh, and saliency maps, again, these are also going to output some kind of feature importances, but they sort of do it in a very different way than Lyme and Shap. Uh, let's take a look at those, okay? So with saliency maps, the idea is that, let's say you have this complex model, and you know you can input images to that model and then it basically makes predictions. In this case, the model is saying the image is that of a junko bird. The question that you're asking is what parts of this image are most relevant for the prediction junko bird, right? So that, that's the question that you're asking and you're hoping to get an output like this 
which basically highlights the important pieces within the image that the model is relying on when making that prediction, Junko bird. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, just for the sake of, I think, thinking about different classes in these settings, so either you could think of a binary class model or a binary classifier where there's a function f mapping you know, to class one, or if you have multiple classes, you can think of a class-specific logit, right? Uh, and fy is a class-specific logit for class i, okay? Right. So there are several methods in order to generate these saliency maps that we just saw. And a lot of these basically play on gradients, right? So, or derivatives, to put it more simply. Uh, so for example, the first method which actually uh, was popular for a while before, of course, then people started detecting issues with it and so on, is this input gradient, uh, where what you're trying to compute is basically the gradient of that class-specific logit, right? So gradient of that function or the underlying model f of x with respect to the instance x whose prediction you want to explain. So what is the reason behind doing this? It's a very simple intuition, right? So you want to see how much does the output change or how much does the underlying function change when you make a small change to the given input data point, right? Or each of the features of that input data point essentially, right? If y changes a lot as a result of changing one particular feature in your input uh, points vector, then essentially that feature is very important for y, right? So that's it, you know, rate of change of y given x, that's essentially the principle you're using and you're computing this and, you know, things that have higher gradient values here will basically mean that the features are more important, okay? All right. So uh, if we sort of take this example and visualize the heat map, uh, where red indicates the regions of higher importance and white is regions of less important, here is the kind of outputs that were produced by these input gradient methods, right? And, you know, several challenges exist with something like this. Uh, first of all, this is visually noisy and somewhat difficult to interpret. Uh, and there are also other issues such as gradient saturation that have been, like, documented. But mainly, if you look at this image, you know, we can see that it's somewhat noisy, we are not sure what to make of it, what is the model looking at, is that what the model looking at, and so on. So in order to fix some of the issues with these methods, there was a variant proposed called SmoothGrad, and what SmoothGrad does is essentially it averages the gradients of noisy input. It does not just take x and compute the gradient of the function with respect to x, it basically takes x, perturbs it n times and then computes the gradient of the output function with respect to each of these perturbations, right? And then you average all that. So you're essentially creating a smoothing effect in this case when computing the gradient, right? And so this is the output for the same image with smooth grad. As you can see, there is, you know, you can make a bit more sort of sense out of this. It is not as noisy as what we were seeing with gradients, right? So the next approach that was proposed again along these lines was that of integrated gradients. And the idea here is, again, you're trying to sort of do some smoothing of the gradients here, but a slightly different kind of smoothing than averaging the gradients, right? So the idea that's being used here is do a path integral, which is basically compute a sum of the interpolated gradients. So you'll think of this as there is some baseline input x tilde. You can think of that as like just a black image, right, with nothing on it. So there is some baseline input. And the way you're thinking about gradients here is you're interpolating gradients between the baseline input and the point, okay? So you're basically going through all the gradients in between and trying to compute the integral of all those gradients on that interpolation. And, you know, again, the output started becoming more and more clearer as people improved these methods one on top of the other. And there are also a few other methods. For example, there is gradient times input. 
which is you don't just compute the gradient, you also do a dot product with the point x itself. So that's the element wise product of you know gradients and the input points. Uh, so that is what produces like images like these. Uh, and there are more variants, for example, there is LRP, layer wise relevance propagation, grad cam and so on. But the point of these kinds of methods is they use gradients in some way or the other and create like, you know, different versions of smoothing of these gradients to sort of come up with the saliency map or the explanation. And this is a pretty popular class of post hoc explanation methods that are commonly being used in a variety of applications, including healthcare, like for example, using chest, chest x-rays to sort of detect tumors and so on. People are also using these kinds of methods for generating explanations there. Okay, so the next class is prototypes and example-based post hoc explanations. So under this broad area, again, there are several approaches. So this is just probably a running note for everything. So I think we are touching some representative approaches in each class or each category. There are several other approaches that, you know, due to time constraints, we are not able to get into. But the goal is to give you a high level idea about each class, right? Okay, so with the prototypes or example based explanations, there are two key methods that have been proposed under this category. At a high level, these class of methods use examples, whether they are synthetic examples or natural examples to explain individual predictions, right? Uh, so the first work is by Percy Liang and his student Pang Wei, uh, which is on influence functions. The goal here is to basically identify instances in the training set that are responsible for uh, the prediction of a given test instance, right? So if you have a test instance, which of the K training instances were responsible for this prediction? That's what you want to identify. And the second is called activa activation maximization, where the goal is to identify again examples, whether synthetic or natural, that strongly activate a specific function of interest or a neuron of interest, okay? So let's talk about the first approach a little bit and then go to the second one. Uh, so here, as I was just explaining, this is the first approach. What we want to ask here is not just look at what pieces of the image are influential to the prediction, but ask the question of which training points have the most influence on the test loss for this particular point and the prediction, right? Uh, so, for example, in this case, you know, the answer might be some other images in the data set that are of a Junko bird, right? And the approach or the technique that is that was used in this work is actually borrowed from a very classic technique in robust statistics, uh, which is titled influence functions. And the goal of, while, while in the classic statistics literature, that this was obviously not used for quote-unquote explanations, uh, there's something called as Cook's distance in uh, you know, classic law of statistics literature. The goal here is we are trying to estimate the influence of each of the points in the training data set on the model parameters, right? So in order to do that, for example, if I want to estimate the influence of this point on the model parameters, one way is, you know, I remove the point out, train the model again, see how the model changes. Right? But that quickly becomes complicated if I have to do it for every point. So there is, an, uh, there is a, a very popular measure called as Cook's distance, which actually gives an analytical expression for computing the change in the model parameters when you sort of like remove a point from the data. So essentially you're computing the influence of that point. Right? So what this paper does is essentially take that basic idea of Cook's distance and apply it to a modern machine learning setting of thinking about explanations and influence of training points on test points and so on, right? So for example, let's say xj is basically a training sample point. Uh, uh, sorry, zj is a training sample point. zi is basically indicating any point i in the data set. And there's also some test point z test, okay? So for those of you who are familiar with machine learning, this is like a classic uh, empiric, empirical risk minimization sort of objective function, and this is what we used to learn model parameters, right? Uh, so these approaches, they sort of think about this slightly differently in the form of an upweighted ERM solution. So let's say our goal is to estimate the influence of 
the point Zj on the model, then you can sort of think about that kind of an upweighted solution. And if you set epsilon to minus 1 by n, that is effectively like, you know, sort of removing the point Zj from the data set. Okay? So this is a slightly generalized formulation so that you can think about the influence of the point Zj on model parameters. So basically, they use that so to sort of compute uh, this kind of influent, influence of the training points on the model parameters. Right? So that, that's the main goal. So ultimately, you want to get to this where you want to compute the influence of a training point Zj on the model parameters. And as you can see, that involves computing a Hessian. And once you have that, then you can estimate the impact of Zj on the loss of Z test, which is a test data point, by using that expression. Okay? And uh, this paper also talked about a bunch of explanations here. Uh, one is you can sort of compute self-influence of uh, mislabeled examples to understand what is happening, right? So if a point is misclassified, if we compute the influence of that point on the predictor, then we can see or potentially understand why that misclassification is happening. Or we could potentially diagnose like a possible domain mismatch where a point is out of distribution and, you know, we can sort of see that by looking at the training examples that are influencing the prediction of this point. And also, because this is helping us identify influential points in the data, potentially if we poison or if adversaries poison those points, then they may be able to change the predictor maximally. Right, so there are several sort of like other applications uh, boiling down into adversarial examples and other kinds of literatures of this approach. So there are a couple of challenges with this kind of approach though. So one is scalability because it involves computing a Hessian as we just saw, right? So that can be hard in practice. Um, and the non-convexity of the objective we are looking at, that also turns out to be challenging in practice. And there are some other papers that try to fix some of these issues. The other approach that we consider under this setting is activation maximization. So this approach, again, the goal is to identify examples that activate a neuron of interest, right? Uh, so and then, you know, the different implementation flavors here are, so one is search for natural examples within a specified data set, a trained data or so, that strongly activate a neuron of interest, or synthesize examples that may not necessarily exist in the original training data, typically via optimization procedures like gradient descent that strongly activate a neuron of interest, right? So either use optimization to find synthetic examples or search in your data set to find the example. So here are some examples that were sort of like output by using each of these approaches. The top row is basically examples chosen from the data set itself, right? Uh, so which were activating certain neurons in a particular intermediate layer strongly. And the bottom is if we use optimization to find such examples, what they look like. So clearly there is a big difference between the kinds of examples you see in both cases, right? So in some sense, the top you can sort of see it's showing some baseball images or, uh, you know, uh, stripes. And then the bottom is like, it's a clear sort of like ambiguity there that whether it's a baseball or stripes is unclear. So the images that you would get when you think about natural examples versus synthetic can look quite different. Okay. Right. Okay. So now the last class of local explanation approaches is counterfactuals, which actually has been popular because of other kinds of applications than the ones that we have been talking about. Right? So at a very bare minimum level, what is a counterfactual explanation? Counterfactual explanations tell us what features need to be changed and by how much to flip a model's prediction. Right? So for example, in this case, what features in this image of a crusted auklet need to be changed and to what uh, in order to get a red face camera? Right? So why is this important or like where is this useful? This is an interesting question because a lot of this area of research is thinking about applications in banking and financing. Uh, because as I was saying earlier, like regulations like GDPR are sort of focusing on those areas as their preliminary areas of enforcement. 
So this, these explanations have become popular because of those areas. So just to understand a scenario here, let's take a look at this example where there is a loan applicant uh, who has submitted their loan application to a bank which has a predictive model which determines if that person should get a loan or not. Right? So in this case, if the person is denied a loan, instead of just saying that, the person might actually benefit if we tell them what they need to do in order to change their profile and reapply for a loan so that they have more success next time they reapply for a loan. Right? So now how do we generate such explanations is basically this area of counterfactual explanations also referred to as algorithmic recourse. So these terms are often used pretty interchangeably in the literature today. So whenever you hear one or the other, you're basically referring to the same thing, right? And the recourse or the counterfactual explanation takes a form of something like this, feature and then the change to the feature, right? So for example, salary, increase salary by 5K, you know, pay credit card bills on time for next three months. So that's the kind of changes that are recommended using these algorithms. Okay, so the strategies for generating these kinds of uh, explanations are many, but they have some common underlying principles. So I'm going to touch upon those first before I get into other details. Okay, so generating counterfactual explanations at an intuitive level you can think of it in a very simple way, right? So your goal is there is some point X on this negative labeled area of the model decision boundary, and you want to find another point uh, in the positively labeled area of the decision boundary that X can morph into, right? So that's the problem. So intuitively, you can think of it as, so now take the point X, and keep perturbing it and pushing it towards the decision boundary. And once it crosses the decision boundary, stop and say X should become that point in order to get a loan, right? Now, the, the question here though is, if I take X and start perturbing it towards the decision boundary, it can either go this way and become this point CF2, or it can go this way and become this point CF1. Which should it become, right? So that is basically where different approaches differ on. So in some sense, the proposed algorithms for solving this problem differ on how to choose among these candidate counterfactuals. And the second thing is how much access is needed to the underlying predictive model. Okay, whether they can work with a black box or whether they need access to the gradients of the underlying model. Right? Okay. So we'll get into some of the details of these approaches now and just go in sequence to see how they sort of go from uh, one to the other. Uh, or actually, let me pause here and see if there are any questions before I do that and go into more details. Um, there, is, there is one question from the uh, uh, chat here that might be relevant to what we were talking about mm -hmm. um, just previously. Um, and the question is generally, what do you think of Anthropic's recent softmax linear units paper? Mm -hmm. um, does it give more hope for building more interpretable model architectures, or should we be focusing on these post hoc explanations that you've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, I would say all the efforts, uh, you know, whether you're trying to sort of do it at the level of the model, whether you're making models more smoother, right, or whether you're using post hoc explanations. These are all efforts in the direction of making something more understandable in some way or the other, right? So at least in my personal opinion, the answer is probably not one versus the other, uh, but I think, you know, sort of having a more clearer characterization of when to go to that and when, you know, would that fail and in that case, would something else help? Uh, so currently, and we'll talk about this a bit more as we go towards the end of this, I think all these approaches are useful. It's just that I feel what is needed is a clearer understanding. Instead of saying it's a this versus that battle, uh, a clearer understanding of here is when this would be more useful, and here is when something else might be more useful. I think that's where we should be headed because this is something that I get asked a lot in different forums as to, oh, so like, you know, maybe we should never use post hoc explanations because there are some disadvantages, which we'll talk about at length uh, in the afternoon session. 
but I think the answer is probably not to pick a side, but like to see when each approach would be useful. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's move forward and try to look at each of the individual approaches in this area. So here is basically the core objective of like a lot of approaches that try to generate counterfactual explanations. So the idea is given a point x, we want to find a point x prime such that the distance between x and x prime is as small as possible and the model's output on x prime is a positive label, right? So you want to find a closest instance to the original instance you started with, such that, you know, these two are pretty close, but also the label of this new instance that you're finding is a positive label, right? And then you ask x to change into x prime, basically. That's the idea, okay? So x prime is called your counterfactual, and x is your original instance, and d can be some distance metric, whether it's L2 distance or you know, some other kinds of distance, Manhattan distance and so on, okay? Uh, so the choice of distance metric is also important because if you're thinking about a practical application, this can dictate what kinds of counterfactuals are chosen, right? Of course, in terms of your optimization methods and stuff, you know, it might make some difference, but I think there's more of something that would make a big difference in practice. Okay, so the first paper that actually touches upon this area is uh, presented by Sandra Walker and her colleagues, and they use normalized Manhattan distance here, but you know, other papers which build on it have started using L2 as a classic distance metric because it improves the optimization pieces, right? Okay, so now, uh, so that, that's basically your minimum distance counterfactuals, right? Uh, so this is the objective. Typically, when solving this objective, Walker and even other methods in this area essentially try to make this constrained optimization problem as an unconstrained one by bringing up these constraints into the objective itself. And then they basically you know, solve this differentiable unconstrained version using optimization algorithms like Adam with random restarts. Right? So as you can see, this is already a non-convex problem, so you would need random restarts in order to uh, have a chance at getting to the global minimum. Okay. All right, so this particular method actually requires access to gradients of the underlying predictive model. So the predictive model can't be a total black box where you're just seeing the predictions of the model. You need to be able to compute the gradients of the model, right? Uh, so here are some examples that this method produces. So for example, it says, you know, if your LSAT score was 34, you would have some predicted score of zero. And, you know, if you change your LSAT score to some value, then this is what would be your predict predicted score, right? So the interesting thing is, just the way this method is implemented, it's suggesting people to change their race in order to uh, get a desired outcome, right? So obviously something like this is not feasible to act upon in practice, but also it is highly unethical to sort of do these kinds of things, right? So that's why there are further approaches which sort of built upon this approach, and that's the work by Ustun et al, where they change this objective to now uh, enforce that X prime, which is the counterfactual that we are picking, should belong to a particular set A, which can be thought of as a set of valid counterfactuals, right? So in that set A, for example, you will not allow changes to race or gender or any other sensitive attributes uh, that are you know, unethical to use, okay? Okay, yeah. All right, so here, as I was just talking about, there's a set of feasible counterfactuals that is often given by the end user and changes to race and gender and these kinds of things are not feasible, right? And there is also an additional thing that you see there that has changed from our first objective that we considered, which is instead of distance, this approach is now considering costs. So in some sense, instead of just saying, I'll compute an L2 distance in this sort of data space, it's saying, you know, some features might be harder to change for a person in practice than others, right? 
So let's try and account for them. Like maybe for somebody who is living in a particular place, it is easy to increase the size of their house or the square footage of their house, but not their salary. And for somebody in another place, the vice versa could be true. How can we incorporate those better when recommending these changes? So let's not just look at the distance in the input space, but look at the cost associated with uh, changing certain features when prescribing this kind of a recourse, right? And as a first sort of a cut, uh, you know, solution to this, this particular approach sort of models cost as a log percentile shift, which basically models this aspect that changes become harder when you are trying to make changes at like higher percentile shift, right? So changing from 90 to 95 might be much harder than going from 50 to 55 percentile, for example. Okay. So this is, of course, what this approach does. Several follow-up works, including some of ours, actually try to learn these costs by asking users about their preferences. Uh, so for example, we did some work where we basically go and ask users, people are bad at assigning this cost straight up to a feature, but if I tell them, would it be easier for you to change your salary versus the square footage of your house, they can give a yes or no answer and do pairwise comparisons well, right? So how to go from there to inferring such costs uh, is of course some follow-up work to this that we and other researchers have done. All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so basically this approach or this paper only considers the case where the model is a linear classifier. So that's, and they also have theory surrounding this in order to say that whatever you're getting out of this is a good solution for a linear classifier. So the way they solve this problem is they formulate it as an integer program and optimize it using CPLEX. Uh, so this approach actually requires complete access to the linear classifier they need the weight vector in order to compute this kind of a recourse or a counterfactual explanation, right? So which may or may not be available depending on the setting you're working with. Okay, all right. So now the question is, what if we have a black box or a nonlinear classifier uh, instead of a linear classifier? Now one potential solution could be something like, you know, generate a local linear model approximation, for example, using an approach like line that we talked about earlier. And then once you get such a local linear model, then apply, you know, this framework in order to get the recourse. So that's one approach. It of course has its flaws and depends heavily on the quality of that local linear model approximation itself. But you know, that, that's the sort of potential way to use this approach with a nonlinear classifier, right? And this is an example of how the output from this particular approach looks like. So basically it has some features to change and what's the current value and what are the required values. So essentially that's the kind of output that these approaches give, right? Uh, so now here, like let's say there is this value called as current depth and you want to decrease that. But one more piece to notice is that in reality, in practice, changing one feature without affecting the other might not always be possible, right? So what do I mean by that? For example, we just told this applicant, reduce your current depth from you know, 3,250 to 1,000. And let's say after one year, this applicant comes back and say, oh, my current depth has reduced to 1,000, now give me a loan. And then the model might say, oh, but your age also increased by one, and this recourse is no longer valid for people whose age has increased by one along with your debt reducing, right? So now, you know, it's very important to account for these feature interactions when generating counterfactuals, but how do we do it is basically the next practical problem which was addressed by some works, right? And the solution is kind of what you might be expecting by now, which is you play with the set A, which is basically the set of feasible counterfactuals that you allow when trying to pick a particular counterfactual for a person, right? And in this case, you will now uh, sort of resort to using structural causal models. So for example, let's say you have access to the causal process that is generating the data which captures all the interactions between different variables in the data and how they interact, you can use that model and allow only those changes which are permitted according to that causal model, 
right? So that's one approach which was suggested in, in literature. But the big question is, what if we just don't have access to the structural causal model? which is often the case because with any real world data set, you rarely get access to a full-fledged causal model of the underlying uh, generation process. Uh, there are also sort of other works which try to work around this problem. One approach basically tries to say if you have imperfect causal knowledge, like you kind of know some relationships, you will try to infer the others and then leverage that. Or the more recent approaches that have become popular are based on variational autoencoders. So the idea is ultimately you want a realistic enough counterfactual, right? So that's your goal. With all this, even when you look at structural constraints and so on, you're saying my counterfactual should not look unrealistic. So how do I generate more realistic counterfactuals, whether it is using the causal graphs or whether it is using some other approach, right? And the other strategy or an alternative strategy that was sort of considered or you know, is becoming more popular these days is, so the goal is the generated counterfactuals should lie on the data manifold. So the approach taken is construct variational autoencoders to map input uh, instances to a latent space, right? And then you search for counterfactuals in that latent space. And once a counterfactual is found, map it back to the input space using a decoder, okay? So this basically helps with a bunch of things, including the fact that your input feature space may not always be smooth or continuous, whereas the chance of your latent space being that is higher. So you're likely to use a gradient descent and get to a point uh, that you want to give us a counterfactual uh, more nicely in your latent space than you might be able to do so in your input space, partly because input space could also be discrete and you could have features that are just binary valued or like rank ordered and so on, right? So that's, that's what this approach is trying to tackle. Okay, so with that, we are pretty much at the end of our uh, local explanation approaches module. And again, between uh, these two approaches, local explanation approaches have gained a lot of popularity compared to even global explanations in the literature and also in terms of adoption, okay? So before I get into global explanations and go over some of the approaches there, I'll pause here briefly to see if there are any further questions about local post hoc explanations. Uh, yeah, so you, you go back by basically using the decoder. So when you in, uh, develop the encoder and decoder, so the decoder will map this point back to the input space and that will help you generate like realistic enough points in the input space. But you might have some correlation with the features and when you go with the decoder, back, this correlation maybe will not, let's say, um, male pregnant, you, you might get this type of strange Right, so the hope is that, I think because this approach does not add anything more on top of you know, the decoder to ensure some of these things, I think the hope is that when you do this encoding decoding process, or especially the encoding process, you're preserving some of these kinds of relationships in the data because they may appear prominently. But as of now, this approach does not add anything else to the decoder. So if something gets missed in terms of like how the encoder is capturing these relationships, you might still run into those problems, but the hope is that that will be taken care of by the encoding. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so let's go to global explanations. And the goal here, kind of contrasting from what we were saying so far, uh, is to explain the complete behavior of a given black box model, right? So in some sense, we want to provide a bird's eye view of the model behavior, and you know the why do we need this is it can help us detect the big picture biases persistent across larger subgroups. For example, the biases persistent against, let's say, a minority group or a particular gender or race, you can sort of see those better with this kind of a bird's eye view, right? That's the goal. Um, and well, one might think, well, I have local explanations. I know how to compute them. Why can't we just inspect these local explanations and then learn about the big picture behavior? 
as we can already see intuitively, that's very hard to do in practice because if you have 10,000 points, manually inspecting all these local explanations and trying to make sense of them is going to be extremely challenging uh, from a cognitive overload perspective for people, right? So that's why we want a better summary of the local explanations and that's what global explanations are trying to do, okay? So in some sense, global explanations are complementary to local explanations in terms of the uh, view they take on the model behavior. Okay, uh, so we already talked a little bit about some of this, so I'm not going to go over that again. Instead, let's look at some of the categories of global explanations. So people have again thought about different uh, you know, approaches to sort of generating global explanations. So one is think of them as a collection of representative local explanations. Uh, so we'll discuss how to do that. The other is representation-based explanations, which is a slightly different category than all the sets of things that we have seen so far. And then there is model distillation, which means you are just trying to sort of use a simpler model to approximate this existing complex model as accurately as you can, given the constraints of the expressiveness of the simpler model. And then, you know, with respect to counterfactuals, what can we do with uh, global explanations? So those are the different approaches that we'll touch upon. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's think about the first approach, which is global explanation as a collection of local explanations, right? So how to generate a global explanation of a black box model? So the high level idea is generate a local explanation for every instance in the data using one of the approaches that you have we have discussed earlier and pick a subset of K local explanations and then return that as a global explanation, right? By saying, you know, instances which look like this have this kind of explanation. That's how you're thinking about a global explanation. But I guess the key question in terms of the exact algorithms you use are, well, what local explanation technique to use and how to choose this subset of K local explanations, right? Uh, so to this end, uh, different approaches were proposed. And again, let's talk about this first in the context of line uh, so that we can understand how to pick a subset of K local explanations, right? Uh, recall that line is used to explain a single prediction. Uh, so essentially, if we are looking at that point uh, that is labeled in the black color, it can provide you a linear model that approximates the behavior of the underlying model in the locality of that point, right? Uh, again, we have been discussing about this challenge of like it's hard to examine all the explanations. So how do I pick K? So that's the question, right? So these K explanations or a subset of K explanations that we pick should have two characteristics. So one is they should be representative. In some sense, they should summarize the model's global behavior. And the other is they should be diverse. They should not be redundant descriptions, right? So for example, let's say if I have picked the point already that is labeled in black color and its associated explanation in my global explanation, I would rather pick the blue point and its explanation next instead of the red because the red is essentially the same linear model, right? Given that you are trying to only pick K points and their explanation to give a global summary, you don't want to pick redundant explanations, right? So now, how do we do this? Essentially, this can be formulated as a submodular optimization problem and a greedy approach can be employed in order to pick such explanations, right? So you basically start with start at some point, pick an explanation, and then maximally try, uh, pick, try to pick explanations that differ maximally from this explanation that you've already picked, right? So that's the way in which you can intuitively think about this process. And you know, this approach is model agnostic, which means you don't need access to gradients of the model, functional forms of the model, architecture of the model, all you need is you should be able to throw a data point at the model, query the label of the point and get it, right? So that's true even of line and SHAP and some of these other approaches, by the way. The distinction often of how much access you need to the model becomes important again in practice because in certain settings you may not have access to say model gradients or model architectures or their functional forms. Okay? All right, 
So similarly, there is another approach called SP anchor, so which is essentially what we uh, you know thought about for line. It's an analogous extension, but for anchor algorithm, and it produces rules, right? So use the anchors algorithm to obtain these local rule set for every instance, and then use the same procedure to greedily select a subset of k local explanations, and then return them as a global explanation. All right, so let's talk a little bit about representation-based approaches because these have gained a lot of popularity in recent times but have also encountered a lot of pushback, okay? and you'll see why in just a bit. Uh, so the goal of representation-based approaches is that you're trying to derive model understanding by analyzing intermediate representations of a deep neural network, right? So in some sense, your main goal in doing so is to see how much do models rely on concepts that are semantically meaningful to humans? So what we want to go from, uh, where we want to go to is, so far we are saying, okay, you give me a bunch of input features and I'll tell you the importance of each of these input features on the prediction, right? But what we are saying is, what if I as a human will tell you a concept that's not a feature in the data? For example, let's look at this scenario, right? So let's say we are looking at this particular prediction where you have the image of the zebra and there's a model that takes this image and predicts the label correctly, right? Now, if I want to ask the question, how important is the concept of stripes to this prediction, where stripes is not an encoded feature in the uh, feature space? I know what stripes is. As humans, we know what that concept means, right? But the model does not, for, mo for the model, it's all pixels, right? So it can only compute importance on the pixels in the image. But now you're saying, I have a concept in my mind, how important is that concept to this prediction? Okay, so how to do that is basically this area of representation-based explanations, okay? So the, one of the approaches that's popular in this area is called TCAV, and the way this approach approaches this problem is as follows, right? So let's say now our goal is to estimate the importance of or influence of the concept called stripes on the predictions of a model, okay? So for this, first of all, I need to tell the model or tell your algorithm what stripes even mean, right? So to this end, I'll give my model two sets of images, the top set of images that you see is all capturing the concept of stripes in different ways, right? And the bottom set of images are just random examples which have nothing to do with stripes. So I'm giving two sets of uh, images, one from the stripes class and the other from a class that is not stripes, like a random set of images, right? Now I pass these two sets of images through the model whose predictions I'm trying to explain. And you know, let's let's pick a particular layer. Let's say you know the Lth layer, uh, which generates a bunch of representations. So let's say our goal is to basically determine how does the concept of stripiness, in some sense, influence like the representations in the Lth layer of this network. Okay. So let's say that that's the goal. Or you know, in fact, there is more we want to say about the prediction. But we can literally do the approach that I'm going to discuss at each layer and then sort of you know, compute the aggregates over all the layers to determine what is the influence of the stripiness concept on the output, okay? But let's just pick the Lth layer at this point, uh, and let's take the representations generated by at that layer by the model for each of these images, both the stripe images as well as the random images, right? And you know, let's say that that's what we are basically getting at the Lth layer for each of these images. Now we build a linear classifier, which basically separates these two classes of vectors. So all that linear, all this linear classifier does is essentially say uh, for this particular image, so here is the vector set or here is the vector that this would give, or it is just basically trying to separate the class. Is this vector belonging to uh, you know, the stripes class or is this vector belonging to the random class, right? So that's what it's doing. Okay, uh, and then now using this uh, sort of linear classifier that we fit, we can actually compute a vector uh, that is orthogonal to the decision boundary and moves in the direction of the concept of stripes, right? So if you see this vector VCL, 
It's orthogonal to the decision boundary. It is pointing in the direction of the stripes class and away from the random class, right? So why are we doing all this exercise? Our goal is to basically get a vector representation of the concept stripes, right? So if I tell stripes to the model, like, you know, stripes is a concept that makes sense to me, but not the model. Now, by doing all this, I generated a vector representation in the space of the representations in the Lth layer that corresponds to the notion or the concept of stripes, okay? So once we have such a vector, then we can leverage this and compute gradients, do all other things in order to get the importance of this vector on the uh, outcome, right? So that, that's basically the logic that's being employed here. So just to recap this whole process, the goal is you'll start with two sets of images. One set of images represents the notion of stripes. The other set of images represents random examples. And then you get the vectors for all of those images from the model, from each of the layers actually. And then you try to build linear classifiers that separate the two classes of uh, vector activations. And you take the vector that is orthogonal to the decision boundary pointing in the direction of the concept of interest. And then you compute derivatives by leveraging this vector to determine the importance of the notion of stripes on a given prediction, right? So the key thing here is we went from having the concept of stripes in our mind to getting a vector which quantifies what is the notion of stripe to the model, right? Okay, great. So uh, let's move to the next class of uh, global explanation approaches. This is called model distillation and has actually been there for quite a long time and also is popular among especially these, uh, you know, tabular sort of like data environments. Uh, so the goal here is that you have this predictive model again f of x that you want to uh, explain or provide a global explanation for. So let's say you have a bunch of data points here that you can throw at this model. You can get the predictions of this model on each of those data points. Okay? You have access to, you have query access to this predictive model and you have access to the data set and the corresponding model predictions. Now you take all this, pass it through an explainer algorithm and then uh, sort of approximate these predictions or rather try to mimic these predictions using a simpler interpretable model, uh, which is you know, sort of a lot more easier to understand, right? So essentially take these models predictions and input instances and try to approximate or mimic the predictions of this model, but now using a simpler model, right? And if you recall, we talked about GAMS a bit earlier when we were discussing inherently interpretable models. So GAMS have actually been uh, proposed as a global explanation solution for a lot of these black box models. So the idea is that, again, take the points, take the predictions, try to fit a GAM on these predictions, right? Of course, how accurate would these sort of fitting GAMS to these kinds of, you know, th this setting would depend on, again, how complex are the predictions to capture using the functional forms of GAM, right? Sometimes you can be successful, sometimes it might be hard. So that depends on the nature of the data and the complexity of the boundaries in the data, right? Okay, uh, so we have discussed at length about, you know, this kind of outcome variable and how the outcome variable is affected by, you know, the different values of the input variable and so on. So I'm not going to touch upon this, but essentially here is what you will try to fit. So what you do is you have input points, you have the corresponding model predictions, you try to fit a gam on it. That's essentially what is happening here. Okay. All right. And as you can imagine, now decision trees have also been considered as this kind of, you know, fitting the simpler models to try and approximate the predictions of the complex models, right? So that was also something that has been explored by some of the prior approaches. And, you know, once you have some class of rule-based approaches, you can imagine people would think of other classes like rule sets and so on. So those are also used in order to approximate uh, these kinds of, like mimic the predictions of the complex models, right? So in some sense, I'll just give you one example of a stylized version of decision sets that at some point we used to work on. Uh, so here, as you can see, 
So this is the summary of what a complex neural net is doing. Uh, this is actually quite accurate, particularly in this particular data set and uh, this particular setting. Uh, but these decision sets are also, I'm calling them stylized because instead of just having some rules, this is sort of ordered in like a two level hierarchy where the upper layer represents subgroup description. So that's basically the description of uh, the properties of certain groups in the data. And then the inner rules basically represent what the model is doing on those subgroups, right? So there is a very clean separation uh, between what is a subgroup and then what is a what is model logic in some sense, right? And that is very helpful in sort of seeing at a high level what the model is doing for like different subgroups in the data. And all of these, including segmenting the data into subgroups and finding rules that explain model logic in that subgroup, all of these are automatically generated and there is ability to customize these, okay? Uh, so for example, uh, so uh, an end user can say something like, explain how this model behaves according, uh, sorry, across patient groups with different values of smoking and exercise. So you know that smoking and exercise are like the features of interest. So you can customize that set of rules that you saw using these two features of interest, that's exercise and smoking. And now the rules are split according to different values of exercise and smoking, right? As you can see, not all values, some, because you also want the rules to be compact. So it's deciding how to divide the, uh, part, partition the space or divide the space based on features of interest, okay? Uh, and how to sort of go about these things or generate these things? Uh, a lot of this can actually be sort of inspired by, and you know, that's a running theme. We talked about some of the objective functions with the decision sets. Uh, so we could employ some of the pieces that are similar to that. Others are a bit different from that. For example, you will try to minimize the number of instances for which the explanations label is not equal to the model prediction, right? So your the sets are producing labels. You want those labels to match the model predictions. And then you will also minimize the number of duplicate rules applicable to each instance so that there is no confusion in terms of like the explanation for each instance. And then you, of course, minimize the number of conditions in the rules. Uh, you also put constraints on the number of rules and the subgroups which is the outer rule. And you can also allow for customizability by saying outer rules should only comprise of features of interest, uh, which are given by the user, right? So these are some of the tricks. And this turns out to again be a similar problem, but this time with like metroid constraints. So you can use like a smoothened out version of some local search algorithms that we talked about previously uh, in order to solve these kinds of optimization problems, okay? And along similar veins, actually, you can think of summaries of counterfactuals. Uh, so for example, we talked about this a bit earlier as to how to generate counterfactual explanations for individual users or individual instances in the data. Now you get a bunch of such counterfactuals or recourses. Now the question is, there is a decision maker or a regulatory authority who is trying to figure out if this particular model and the associated recourses are reasonable or if they have some bizarre biases that are going on that we can't figure out, so how to help them, right? So in some sense, how do recourses permitted by the model vary across various racial and gender subgroups? Are there any biases according against certain demographics? And the biases in this context could look like you're asking some people to change a lot of features, whereas you're asking some other people to just change very little, right? And you're doing, or that decision is somehow getting hinged on or based on what racial subgroup they belong to or what gender subgroup they belong to, then it's a problem. Right? So let's just maybe see this example. So for instance, uh, you are trying to, uh, so here is basically the sort of this kind of a summaries of counterfactuals. What this is saying is for different subgroups, again, the subgroups are generated, uh, uh, sorry, captured by the outer rules. And for each subgroup, you are seeing what needs to be changed for that person to sort of get a loan, right? So for example, if race is, uh, race is Caucasian, gender is male, so you're asking that person to change has job from no to yes, right? The rest is fine. 
Uh, and similarly, uh, drugs from yes to no. Right? On the other hand, for Caucasian females, you're asking them to change two features in the second rule instead of one for the corresponding Caucasian male. Right? Uh, so similarly, if the race is different, you're actually asking people to change a lot more features. Now, this kind of a bias is a problem because you're making one subgroup do a lot more work or put more effort when getting a recourse, but this you can only know when you have a summary of all the counterfactuals or the recourses that the algorithm is generating for a given model. Right? So that's, that's why these summaries can be useful. All right, uh, so again, the outer rules that you see, just similar to some of these other summaries that we have looked at earlier, are the subgroup descriptors, and then you know the inner rules that you see are the recourse rules which tell a person or other, which tell us what features need to be changed and from what to what, right? Okay, so now, you know, if the regulator sees that this is in fact what is happening with respect to the recourses, they can actually realize that, okay, this is biased, it's requiring certain demographics to act upon a lot more features than the others, right? And the desiderata in this case will be that we want the recourses that are coming out in these summaries to be correct. So in some sense, we want to minimize the number of applicants for whom prescribed recourse does not lead to a desired outcome, right? So that you don't want to capture those things in the summary because that's an incorrect summary. And then the other thing is you want recourse coverage where you're trying to minimize the number of applicants for whom recourse does not exist. So in this set of rules, you don't see a recourse for certain applicants, we want to minimize that set of people, okay? And then we want to minimize the total feature costs as well as magnitude of changes in the feature values, right? So that's basically like the generic way of, by the way, the summaries of recourses that we saw or the counterfactuals that we saw, that summary itself can be used to prescribe recourses to individuals too, right? So it can have a dual purpose. It can serve as a summary to tell a regulator what is happening. And you can also use the exact same thing to prescribe recourses to individuals. So it's a dual approach, right? Given that it's a dual approach, we are also trying to focus on minimizing the total cost required to implement the recourses that are being prescribed for each group, as well as the magnitude of the changes that are required, right? And of course, we need these summaries to be interpretable, uh, which means we can't let this sort of summary uh, you know, rule set bloat up. So we want some constraints on the number of rules, number of conditions in the rules, number of subgroups, and we can also provide customizability by ensuring that outer rules only comprise of these features of interest to the stakeholders and those features don't show up in the inner rules, for example, right? Okay, so again, it's a similar kind of problem as the one that we just talked about with the two-level decision sets without the recourse or without the counterfactuals, so that's what it turns out to be ultimately. So I think with this, we are almost at the end of this module. So what I can do is take a few minutes of questions and then maybe we'll pause here and then reconvene uh, back right after lunch. <laughs>